much. So, um, morning everyone. Good to be here. Welcome, Justine. <laughs> we, uh, we're busy with Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. We are now currently in chapter 3. We're going to start from verse 6 this morning. I just quickly want to hear, how are you finding it? Song of Song, Solomon. Exciting, okay. It's quite deep, hey? It's very deep. I, I find that I, I am stirred in different ways with this book. Um, in my relationship with God, I am, I am also at a place where I'm like, you have I built some things in my life between me and God. Where sort of you forget about that love, you know, and how he loves you and how we love him and how we can love him. And, and so for me, this is a very nice journey. So thanks, Diane, that we can now do Song of Solomon. I'm learning quite a bit um, as we go along on this journey. And as I was preparing for today, um, as I've told you before, there's so many interpretations and things that happen in this book that people interpret differently. But as I was preparing for today and looking at all the commentaries and the things happening, shh, carry on. Um, it, it was quite interesting that most of them look at the natural. Okay, like literally, I don't know how many I've read through. Most of them look at the natural interpretation. And, and even if I look at all my Bibles, the different Bible studies, books I have and whatever, I was surprised at, like, you, you, you really read about the spiritual connotation here. Okay. And so for the, for the first 3,000 years, this was the interpretation. It was the spiritual interpretation. And the Jews today still see this as God and Israel. Okay, it's only the last 300 years that they've been starting to interpret this in a natural way, which it is, of course. You can learn much about marriage and intimacy and whatever from this book. But it's, it's almost like now they've just let go of the spiritual. And so for us just to be vigilant... I almost want to say, I'm learning so much about God and his love from this book. How can I just not just ignore that? Okay, and, and it almost want to show me that, that there's some aspect of the word that the enemy always wants to take away, steal away from us. And um, as I was reading today's piece, I'm like, God... <laughs> I'm wrestling with this. I'm praying about it. I say, Lord, show me Jesus. I want to see Jesus in here. What am I missing? And um, even as I'm reading commentaries, I'm like, you're reading it, but I don't fully get to understand it. And so I have to sit with the word. I have to say, Lord, help me. I'm praying. What does this mean? Show me. Give me more revelation. And I think for all of us, you know, as we do this Bible study or as we just do a normal Bible study, never to just be satisfied. Okay, read this. Oh, I heard someone once said, this is what it means, and now I go on. You know, but to say like, Lord, what are you saying? And what are you saying to me now through this word? Because this word is alive and active. Hey, don't forget that. So you can maybe go and you read a verse and you're like, oh, God said this to me last year about this verse. But he might be saying something else today. And this is what I love about the word, okay? It never contradicts itself. So if you're getting any funny interpretations <laughs> that doesn't align with the rest of the word, then it's not, it's probably not the interpretation. But if it aligns and you know, oh, God is showing me this, God is showing me that. Okay. Getting out of breath. <laughs> It is exciting. <laughs> okay, good. So just to catch up quickly, so last week we had this, um, this maiden lady. And, um, and what happened when we interpreted spiritually, like she was, she was looking for this, this man. She couldn't find him, hey? Because he said to her, come, come to me away on the mountain. She said, no, 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 you, you go. So she, she sort of stayed in her comfort zone. Do you remember that? Okay. And so she stayed in the comfort zone. And then all of a sudden she was like, oh, no, where is he? I can't find him. And she went to look for him. And eventually she got off the bed. 
her comfort zone. She went into the city to go look for him, and then she found him. And then what did she say? I do not want to leave you. I never want to let you go. Okay? And so we said that sometimes in our lives, you know, God, it feels like God isn't there anymore. It's not like he's not there anymore. It's just that we have not, we have not followed him to where he wanted us to go. And so we find ourselves, he's not removing himself from us in the sense of we're not totally alone, not at all. We just don't feel his manifest presence because he wants us to come to a place where he is out of his love. Because remember, he is jealous for us. Hey? So he really wants all of our love. And so he's, he just sort of removed himself and she's like, oh no, I can't find him. And then she went to look for him. Um, she had to literally get off the bed, go into the city, and she found him, and she said, this is amazing. I don't want to let him go. Okay, do you remember that? I can't remember what verse that was. was. <laughs> and then the verse, of course, said, do not awaken love um, before, before, until it des- so desires. And what we said about that is that, that is, don't, don't disrupt So it's talking to the daughters of Jerusalem, right? It says to them, do not disrupt what is happening here with this woman in her relationship with the king or in her relationship with this guy, which in our case is the father. And I was thinking about this. You will find in your relationship with God, the moment you get to a place of great intimacy or commitment or, you know, people will start to sort of, tease you about it, you know, and this, this especially happens in the church, because out there, they don't really care about your relationship, you do what you want, I do what I do, but when it comes to a walk with God, sometimes in the church, people will tease you, and this has happened to me so many times, you know, in the church, so people will say, hey, um, let's go to the clubs tonight, and I know what happens in the clubs, so no thank you, I don't want to be there, and they'll be like, oh, you're so holy, you know, so those small things, they want to come and tease you with where you are at. But for us to know, like, no, 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 do not, do not disrupt what's happening here. And for us to keep on moving in our relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? So I just wanna, wanted to say that again. Okay, let's get to Song of Songs 3 verse 6. And um, we have the background now of what happened here. And then we get to this verse. It says, What is that coming up from the wilderness, like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powers of a merchant? <clears throat> I'm going to read that whole piece. Behold, it is a litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war each with its sword at its thigh against terror by night. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made a post of silver, its posts, its back of gold, its seed of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, so that's until verse 10. What is happening here? So now she just said she doesn't want to let go. And now we're in a total different scene, okay? Although it's the same chapter. Remember, in those days, there weren't chapters or anything like that. That was added later on. And what's happening here is it's saying, what is coming from the wilderness? Or actually, the, some translations say, who is this coming from the wilderness? And we see this type of chariot thing coming out of the wilderness and also with some smoke, they say, and then with perfume, Okay? I've really asked God, what is happening here? How do we interpret this? Okay, so when we look at those days, so many interpretations say this is like a marriage, um, what's the word, procession, okay, that's happening here. So when people got married or before they get married, they're in this sort of carriage thing or they're on this thing where they carry you on their shoulders, so it's like sort of a bed, a couch thing, 
And so they carry them, and there's all these guards around them. And, you know, you see them because as they move, there's, like, dust coming up. Some interpretations say, you know, in those days, they, they even carried, like, candles or, or, or what's fuckles. Fuckles. Any Afrikaans people know what a fuckle is? Okay. So it's like lights they carry, fires in the night, and that causes also smoke, you know. Um, so there's this, you can see something's coming, okay? And it's coming out of the wilderness. And so when we see the word wilderness in the Bible, we think about Israel, right? Israel, who was in the wilderness for 40 years, we think of about the time of challenging, a time of testing, a time of getting to know God, Okay, because he said to the one lady, he said to her, come to me into the wilderness where I can speak softly to you. It's a time of being alone, of being intimate as Jesus went into the wilderness to be of the Father fasting. Okay, and so here we can see a picture of something beautiful happen, happening. It's the groom and his bride, and they're coming. And we see this beautiful picture. So how do we interpret this in a spiritual sense? Because in, when we here on earth with Jesus, we are not married to Jesus yet. We're getting to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the bride, hey? That's going to be beautiful. Revelation 19 teaches us about this. But here in this earth, we are engaged, right? We said, God, I'm fully committed to you. I give you my life. We are engaged to Jesus. And so when I look at this, I see a picture of us walking on this earth. So this is now the bride and the groom next to each other. And I see this picture of we are walking on this earth and Christ is in us. Hey, do you agree? Christ here, he says, I am in you, I am with you. And now what happens when Christ is in us, this smoke and this... Uh, dust or whatever, is a picture always in, in the Old Testament of God's glory. Hey? When, 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 when he fills his presence, you know, with, in, the, in, the, in the tabernacle, it's just smoke. You know, it's just beautiful. It's his glory coming down. And so here are we coming, and we are, here we are on, in this earth, and we will walk in the wilderness because this world is like the wilderness, compared to eternity. And we will portray Christ in us by who we are, by glory. And when you think about that light, we are the light of the world. We shine. It's, different. it's a different scene than anything else. And I want to, it's, it's like, I actually don't know how to break this down or how to get us excited about this because we are, we are engaged to the king, the king of kings. We are his. And so when we are his, we look different, isn't it? Like he's in me. And when you think about that, that scripture that says we are seated with him in heavenly places. And so here's a picture of the bride next to the groom. And here, here, here we are in this world, in this wilderness. But we have God's glory. We carry this with us wherever we go. And so sometimes we get so in this world that we forget about the glory that we are carrying. We forget about the light that we are shining. We forget that when we walk into a room, the atmosphere changes. Why? Because Christ is in us. Now, we can get so lazy about that. We can so forget about this. But it's like God is saying, hey, I am with you. And when the king is with you, it doesn't look the same than with people that doesn't have the king. Is this making sense? Okay, so as they walk along, they say, okay, so this King Solomon re represents Jesus as king, right? And so, so here's Solomon, and around it are 60 mighty men. I actually want to read this from the other translations. Um, oh no, it says, all of them wearing swords of, and experts in war, each with its sword at its thigh against terror by night. Now what, what would that represent for us? We are protected. Now get this, he's got his 60 best warriors. Because you just need the best for the king and his bride, right? He's definitely going to say, hey, who's available? 
No, no, no. <laughs> it's the best warriors that is protecting this carriage or this uh, whatever you call it. And so for you to know today that you are protected by experts in war. And so this we forget also, that we are protected, that God protects us. He sends us his spirit who talks to us, who leads us, who gives us dreams and visions and things and, and warns us, and, 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 and his blood covers us. We are protected. We do not have to be afraid. And so when I look at this picture, I mean, guys, please go pray about it and, 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 and read about it and, and ask God more. But when I look at this, I'm like, I'm, I'm seeing myself here with this king on this earth, walking with glory and shining his light and being protected as I walk on this journey because he, he is mine and I'm his. And we're going to read that later in Song of Solomon. Then we get to this carriage where it says that he made it himself. He prepared this for us himself. Okay, We're from the wood of Lebanon, which, um, let me just maybe get to that. It's the strongest wood. And this wood was like inside was normal wood, but outside it was covered with gold. And, and that's the picture we shared at Revelation also. The wood itself means Jesus in his humanity, but also the gold around is, but he is also God. So here you have Jesus, man, and Jesus, God. And so that represents this whole carriage that we are in. Okay? Um, I actually skipped over the whole frankincense, frankincense, how do you say, and mirror. So mirror is always a... We said this uh, 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 perfume for, for people who are, who are dead, you know? <laughs> Embalming, yeah. So it, it, it just helps with, so it, it talks about Jesus' death. The frankincense talks about, remember when we did the book of Revelation, always talks about the prayers of the saints. So it talks about intercession, and then those merchants talks about commitment. So I'm committed to buy. My hands are full of the smell of perfumes. Okay, so, so there's so much in the story that we can just get out of this. Like, we, we carry, you know, Christ with us because he died for us, you know, because he's making intercession for us, because he's committed to us. Like, just go meditate on those three things. Like, our lives can change. Okay, so I'm skipping and going back, so sorry for that. For that. I hope you're still with me. So this thing that he made, this carriage himself, Jesus himself made the gospel in which we rest, like the good news. He himself made this because as we're walking and, and walking with him, what are we carrying with us? The good news, the gospel, wherever we go. Okay. And then he talks about the silver and the gold, and they say this is a picture of redemption and divine character, and it's interior paved with love. Now, when I read that the first time, I was like, because they said, by the daughters of Jerusalem, I'm like, how, what does this make sense? Because the daughters of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in this book represents uncommitted believers, right? So why would they pave this, this carriage or whatever with love? And then Reading a different interpretation, they said that word actually doesn't mean by, it's for, for the daughters of Jerusalem. So, like, this whole thing is, is covered in love. Now, just think about it quickly. In the natural, you can't cover something with love, right? But spiritually, this thing is covered with love so that the daughters of Jerusalem can see, wow, the foundations of this is love. God is love. It is not a, oh, I want to be fancy, or I want to be famous, or I just want what I want. No, this foundations here I love. Are you also with me? I feel like I'm talking Demokar, but as long as you get something, um, it should be okay. And then um, verse 11 says, Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. 
very interesting um, thing here. He is crowned. So a king is crowned as king with a different crown than when he would wear when he gets married. Okay? So some interpreters said it's like those floral crowns, you know, type of thing. It doesn't really matter. But who's crowning him is, is his mother. And now if you look in a spiritual sense, you're like, okay, this doesn't make sense at all, you know. But this one guy interpreted quite interestingly. He said, the church can be spoken of as a mother or the agency by which people are led to their new birth. Okay? Just bear with me. In one sense, the church crowns Jesus as king by responding in love to his kingship. Okay? It's not like he's never king. He's king. But responding to him, to his kingship, we are crowning him as king over our lives. Does it make sense? Okay? When we love Jesus, we crown him as our personal king. The wedding crown speaks of the accumulated response of the redeemed through history. Jesus has gladness about his wedding. Okay? So basically just speaking that the church has crowned Jesus as king. Okay, so not for us to get too confused about that. Okay, so many interpreters, and especially the natural sense, will say that was a wedding scene that happened there. Okay, but for us, we, we more see it like a wedding intro, if I can say that. It's on the way to the big day. Okay, and so the next chapter, chapter 4, is very It's beautiful, okay? And so some people interpret this in a natural sense as like intimacy, okay, after the wedding. Okay, so you will read that many in many um, commentators. But as we see it now is that we are with the king. The king is in us, so the spirit is with us. So when we are with the king, what happens? He affirms us. He affirms our identity who we are, and you will see that many of these things, as we, we're not going to spend too much time on that, but as we read through this, you would be like, oh, but I'm not like that, or this is not really me, or I fall short here, or whatever, but the beauty about Jesus is he never says, um, you know, one day when you get there, you will be beautiful. <laughs> no, he, he says, my love, my beautiful he speaks to us like things into being that, that is not, hey? And I found this in my own life, that I start to speak things over people that's not necessarily there now, but I start to speak to them as if that is who they are. I start to, to, to call it out of them all the time, and what happens is people start to live like that. You know, but when you start to speak to people like, you know, yeah, one day you will be courageous. No, it's not going to help much, is it? And this is what we see Jesus doing here when he speaks to his bride. He speaks as if it is. And I want to tell you for us also to know that. When you hear and you think God speaking to you and he's like, oh, if you will just, you know, be more loyal. Then you must identify that God doesn't speak like that. You know, he would say, my loyal child, okay? So he doesn't come with condemnation. He comes with conviction. So when he says to you, my loyal child, and you're like, oh, wow, God sees me loyal. I don't know if I'm loyal, you know, but I want to be loyal. I want to be loyal to, to Christ. Okay, am I speaking too much? Desiree, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so from chapter 4, as another Jesus speaking to his bride, he says, behold, you are beautiful. Now, ladies, <coughs> sorry, isn't that something that we struggle with? Hey? Isn't that something that, that, that someone would tell you, oh, you look so beautiful today, and you're like, oh, it's an old dress, <laughs> you know, or I got this from Jet, <laughs> that's my thing, you know? And, and, and we so quickly hide away from the fact that, that someone says we're beautiful. It's so difficult sometimes to receive just the fact that we are beautiful. And I don't even want to speak about the guys, you know, when we tell them you're handsome or whatever. In the beginning, Derek was like, oh, I am. You know, like, 
And, and so for us to, to see like God speaks to us like this. And, and how often do we think that he, when he speaks to us, it's like, he, it's like ooh, oh, let me just cover all my sin. Let me just, when I come to God, let me not, let me not show him who I am. You know, and he's not intimidated by any of our sin or our faults or whatever. When he looks at us, he says, behold. That word, behold, stop, listen. You are beautiful. And what? My love. My love. Not you, naughty child. Hey? You are beautiful, my love. You know, and I've, I've said this before, but when you know someone loves you, you just want to be with them and love them back. Hey? And so he says, behold, you are beautiful. He's saying that twice. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Now, this sounds like so romantic. Not really. Leaping down the slopes of Gilead, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing all of which be twins. <laughs> among not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of gazelle that graze among the lilies. Okay, so... All of this has certain interpretations in the natural. All of it means something in the natural. So for us, it's like, this is ridiculous. I mean, if Derek says to me, your teeth is like, what is it? <laughs> you know, I'm going to be like, okay, well, thank you. I feel so beautiful right now. Um, but in the spiritual sense, we can get quite a bit from here. Okay? And so I'm going to go with this one guy who said that there are eight character traits that the Lord wants to de develop in his bride. And he's speaking it over her already. Okay? And so the first one is the dove's eyes. Now remember previously we said dove's eyes, they, just, they can just look in one direction. Okay? So they, when they look, they, they use their heads. Okay? So it's like single-mindedness. And so the dove's eyes talks about eyes of single-minded devotion and loyalty to the Lord. It's like your eyes. It's like dove's eyes. You only see me. You're only devoted to me. So that's the first trait. The second one, hair like goats. Okay? I don't think I want hair like goats, but it, it, it represents a characteristic trait that says dedication to God. Okay? Remember when they let their hair grow, the Nazarites? That means dedication to God. Then teeth like shorn sheep. <laughs> and this guy said, to him, this represents chewing on the word. You meditate on the word the whole time. This is, I mean, how many of us meditate on the word? It's like, okay, let's read my two verses for the day. <laughs> Maybe it will help me through the day, but am I meditating? Am I making it part of who I am? Lips like scarlet. He says, godly speech that calls forth God's redemptive purpose in others. Because that scarlet is redemption, right? So whenever you see lips or teeth, you know, or mouth, it talks about God's word, right? It represents his word. And so how many of us, you know, God is calling that out of us to speak the best over others, to speak life, to call out the best in others. And then we get to the kisses of the mouth. And this is the scripture I've been meditating on, the first one in Song of Psalms. Let let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his love is more delightful than wine. And so what we see here is that the word of God just coming, just loving on us. Okay. I think sometimes we read the word and we're just thinking of what must I correct in my life. Hey? Okay, I'm coming to preach, to a preach on Sunday even. I'm hearing God's word and I'm just thinking, where must I go right? Instead of sometimes being... How is God loving me today? Hey? What if we come to a preach or we read the word and we're like, how is God loving me today? How can I just receive his love today? Do you think we'll change a bit? Instead of wanting to be these Christians that do the right thing and operating out of works and things, and now I'm just 
oh, he, oh God, how are you loving me today? And I respond out of a place of love instead of correction and, uh, you know, works. Just a thought, okay. Wild templates, ach, templates. <laughs> Wild temples or the cheeks or countenance, it talks about emotions empowered by the grace of God. So whenever it's, it talks about cheeks, remember we said last time, this is where you see your emotions, right? So emotions empowered by the grace of God. It's quite a deep one. I think we can do a whole preach on <laughs> just that one. And then neck like David's tower. So when we see neck, it, it always represents um, obedience, Okay. You're either like a stiff-necked people, you know. God often speaks in his word about the stiff-necked people. And so when he says, neck like David Stow, it's setting our will to obey God without any stiff-necked resistance. Okay, you're also with me. Then the last one is the breast like fawns, okay. So this can have many interpretations, but what this guy said, he said, it's the power to edify and nurture others with the milk of the word. Just think that is the purpose of breast, is to feed the young. Hey? And so to feed others with the word. So there's eight characteristic traits that's found in this, actually such a beautiful romantic image, but for us as believers to be like, I want to be like that. And God is calling it out of us. He's speaking it over us as if it is already. Okay. Good. Then we get to verse 6. He's, and, and it says, Until the day breathes and the shadow flee, I will go away to the mountain of Myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Okay, so this is a tricky part here because some translation says this is he saying this and other translations say this is she saying this. And I think, you know, if you really want to, you can probably interpret it both ways. Okay? But let's say it's the lady speaking here and she says, until the day breathes and the shadow flee, I will go away to the mountain of Myrrh. I remember last time she didn't want to go away to the mountain, right? She said, no, no, no. <laughs> Let this pass and then I will go to the mountain. But now she's like, no, I will go. It doesn't matter how it looks like. And so what's happening here, um, she has a new commitment to her lover. She has new commitment to her king. Okay, something has changed here. Okay, and when it talks about the mountain of Myrrh, what, what would that be? to dying to self. Okay, I will go up the mountain of Myrrh because I will die to myself. It's no longer about what I want or my comfort. Remember when she was lying on the bed saying, where are you? You know, it's no longer just about my comfort, but I actually want to die to myself. I will go. And this one commentator said, how beautiful to Jesus are the words, I will go. <laughs> hey? When he talked to Isaiah, who will go? Isaiah, like, I will go. Then, of course, it goes on, and I think this is, this is God or, or the man speaking here again. He says, come with me from Lebanon. My bride, come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinner and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Okay, so this is still the Lebanon, still talking about the mountains. But now come with me. So you're not doing this on your own. But see, there is place where there's dens of lions and there's the mountains of leopards. So this one interpreter said, she must war against lions and leopards, animals that devour humans. And he says, Satan is like, likened to a roaring lion. This verse speaks about spiritual warfare. So for us to know that we will have resistance along the road, especially when we go up to the mountains, especially when we say, I will go. 
Hey? I think sometimes when we say, I will go, when I said, okay, Lord, I'll go to Durban, <laughs> and he said, come, you think now he's going to be like, wow, amazing, Mary. let's just open the path for you, everything's going to go right. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure, he'll do that, but there will be resistance. Because if God wants you to go somewhere, do you think the enemy's going to be like, oh, yes, let's get out of the way. You know, God said go, so let's go. No, no, no. <laughs> there will be lions and, and, and leopards wanting to keep you do not go up the mountain. Do not experience what God wants you to experience in those seasons, right? And for us to know in those seasons that we need to know how to do spiritual warfare. Okay? We don't often talk about this in church or so. But we need to know because God said your fight is not against flesh and blood. Okay? And this weekend we will see that also. We, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We want strongholds to come down. You know, there are, there are powers and principalities over areas, over cities, over things, and, and those need to be broken down, you know. Anyways, let me not get too excited about that one. Okay, then we get to verse 9. You have captivated my heart. Okay, so he's speaking to her. You have captivated my heart. Let me just see what it says in, in a different verse. I got this different translation. It says, you have stolen my heart. <laughs> you have captivated my heart. My sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. With one jewel of your necklace. Okay? So I find this so stunning. <laughs> so when he says, my sister, you're like, I mean, please, Derek, don't call me your sister. That's just <laughs> not going to work for me. But when Jesus calls his bride my sister, it just talks about he was on this earth. He was also a man. Okay? And, of course, his bride, he's coming back for his bride. But then he says, my, you have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. Remember when we said the eyes is only fixed on Jesus, and with one glance at your eyes is that I want to follow Jesus. I want to obey him. I'm loving him with everything. What does, God, what does God really love when we love him? When we are fully devoted to him? And he says, you have captivated me with your eyes because you want to love me. You love me. You know, I can see it in your eyes. You want to follow me. And so there's something beautiful happening here. And I just want to mention this, you know, sometimes we think we should be a perfect Christian to have that in our eyes. But that's not what God is looking for. He's just looking for someone who wants to love him. You know, I, many times in the mornings I'm like, Lord, I just want to love you with everything. Like, this is what I want to. But it's like Paul writing, like, I know what I should do, but I don't do it. You know, because there's a wrestle in this earth all the time. So don't come and push yourself down. Oh, why don't I love God like that? Just tell him, Jesus, I love you. And the enemy will come and say, you lying. You did this and this and this. <laughs> you say, footsick. <laughs> you say, Jesus, I love you. I love you. I want to follow you. I want to give you all my heart. I want to live all my days for you. Speak to him like that. Don't think, no, because I messed up, I can't speak to him like that. He loves you, and he sees you for who you are much better than you see yourself. Tell him how much you love him. He, he says, my heart is captivated. <laughs> and then when it talks about the jewels on your neck, like each jewel, you know, when you have all these things around your neck, each jewel, they say, let me just get it right, talks about um, the neck can speak of the will, okay, or submissive or resistance. So you're either in your will resisting or uh, submissive, you're right? Spiritually, each link of her necklace may represent each individual response of obedience that, we'll give, that we give the Lord. Each decision for love that we make moves Jesus' heart, moves Jesus' heart. He remembers every movement of love that our heart makes towards him. Okay, so let's just read that, that verse again. It, it says, um, 
You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace, with that one step of obedience, with that one act of submission to me. You have moved me. Hey? Just imagine you're standing there and someone is coming for you with their words and you, yo, you've got to come back. Hey? don't know about you, but sometimes I'm like, yo, I can now throw my words out of here as well. And the Holy Spirit just says, don't. And you, you're obedient. You just keep quiet. It moves God's heart because you listen to him and you submit to him. And that, that just shows such incredible love for our Father. Hey? Does it make sense? Okay, then it goes on and says, How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Okay, so now he turns it back, what she says to him, and basically just say, Your love is better than anything. Okay, remember we said wine can be bad or good, so for, for us as people, you know, when we say we want your love, it's better than the bad stuff of this world and it's better than the good stuff of this world. But of course, for, for God, it's just the good stuff. That wine represents celebration, bride, um, a marriage, you know. And it's just, it's just so much better than that, your love, than anything good. Okay. And then the scents, the fragrance of your oils, than any spice. So that fragrance of oils is what's coming from inside now. That's the characteristics. That is what we show as we, as we walk on this earth. Who, what is our character? So he says that fragrance of your oils is much better than spices. Okay, so what you reproduce or whatever. Okay, so I should run now because we're getting <laughs> stuck here. Verse 11, your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are orchards of pomegranates with all choices fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices. A garden fountain, a well of living water, flowing streams from Lebanon. Okay, so your lips drip as honeycomb. He's just saying, this speaks of her words being sweet like honey when she speaks to God in worship and prayer. And when she blesses and encourages others. And then the frankincense of garments is like the frankincense of Lebanon. This referred to her deeds being fragrant before God. Garment speaks of the bride's acts of obedience. We also see this in Revelation 19. And it says, the bride's dedication to the king was described as a garden with a spring and a fountain. The garden of a king was private, okay? It was enclosed with a fence to keep animals from polluting it. A sealed up spring and fountain speak of an undefiled water supply, unpolluted by animals. Okay, I'm reading this, otherwise we will take longer. Okay. The bride's life and ministry were described as an orchard filled with fruits, plants, trees, and spices. This speaks of the fruitfulness of her life. Okay? And the spirit's ministry in the bride's life is described as a fountain, a well, and streams. These three sources of water can refer to the different ways we experience the spirit in our lives. Okay? So it's quite deep what's happening here. Um, and you can go study it, you know, for yourself. But you can just see the fruitfulness of what's coming from this bride. Okay. Then I want to get to verse 16. Um, I've heard songs about this, and this, this really grabs me. Awake, O north wind. Awake and come south wind. Blow upon my garden. Let its spices flow. Okay. In other words, come Wind from the north, come, wind from the south, blow on my garden. And what happens when there's wind into your garden? You know, the fragrances go, right? So this interpretation, the one that I really can identify with, is that she's praying for both the adversity and the blessing 
to come and flow into her garden. That's a bold prayer. Okay? So both the things that's coming from the north and both the things that's coming from the south come and blow into my garden because what wants to come out is the fragrance of, of my love for Jesus. Okay? So when do we grow much? The most, sorry. is in adversity. When it's not going so well. But we also grow when we experience the love and the goodness and the blessing of Jesus, right? And she's saying in this instance that I want both to blow into my garden. And so many times we will pray for only one. Lord, just bless me. Right? I just want the blessing. But what we don't realize is if we don't get to face the difficult circumstances, there's some aspect of who Jesus is that we cannot portray to the rest of the world. Isn't it? I have had friends, and I'm sure you too, and you too have been through many difficult situations. And these difficult situations, my one friend's boy drowned a few years ago. It was the worst day. But how she has walked through this and how she has shined, you know, how many people have been touched. They had a, a thing the other day. She didn't even speak about Jesus. She did not mention Jesus. They were at a golf event. And they came to her afterwards and said, she said there was a few drunk guys that were playing golf. And they came to her afterwards and they said to her, we want to meet your Jesus. She's like, she was so shocked because she didn't even mention Jesus. Like, she didn't even mention her faith or anything like that. And so for us to know that even in the difficult things, we need that in our lives, although it's so challenging. But if we don't have that, how are we shining Jesus to a broken world? Because remember, people are experiencing difficult things in this world. So if we are Christians, we're like, no, I'm just blessed. <laughs> You know, then people are like, okay, fine, I can't fit in here because I'm so broken and I've got such difficult things that I had to go through. But if I can tell, hey, these difficult circumstances, I still love my Jesus. And in fact, I love him more when I go through these things and I feel him so close to me. Hey? So she's saying from both sides, I want this to come, Lord, because I want to really give all this beautiful fragrance. Does it make sense? Okay. <clears throat> and then it sort of changes the scene, and, and she says, let my beloved come to his garden. So now she's not just speaking, it's my garden. She says, it's his garden. What was mine is actually his. And eat its choicest fruit. So Lord... It's not just mine and for my satisfaction, but it's for you and for your enjoyment. My life, my fruits, it's for you. And Diane said this morning, she just realized again, it's all that we do is for God's glory, never for us. So come, Lord, come into your garden. It's never been mine, it's yours. And come and enjoy the fruits and he responds and he says, I come to my garden. <laughs> he acknowledges, yes, this is my garden. And just see how many times he uses that my word, my sister, my bride. I gather my mirror with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. And the other said, eat friends, drink and be drunk with love. So what I was keeping for myself, I said, oh, Lord, it's actually yours. I realized, she realizes something that nothing actually belongs to her. Everything belongs to him. And he acknowledges as well, and he enjoys the fruit of what's coming from us, which is to him and for him. Okay. I think that's it. Amen. Okay, so I talked a 